Chapter 15 is about the diversity of animals. It is a very long chapter and it contains a lot of information. So if you read the chapter and take notes and then watch the video, you're going to notice I leave a lot of stuff out. That's because this video would be two hours long to contain all the information and it's just not necessary. It's interesting, but it's just not necessary to tell you all these tiny defining characteristics. So to start with, we'll look at the features of animals in general, and then we'll split them up into groups. We'll talk about sponges and idarians, flatworms, nematodes, arthropods, mollusks, analysts, annelids, echinoderms, chordates, and then focus on the chordates that are vertebrates. So it's very, very, very long. So when we talk about animals, we're talking about organisms that are eukaryotic, multicellular, they tend to be modal, they have the ability to move around, they're heterotrophic, so they ingest living or dead organic matter in order to get their carbon to survive. They may be meat eaters, plant eaters, both, or they may be parasitic. A lot of them reproduce sexually, some of them are capable of reproducing asexually, and for a lot of them, their offspring have to pass through some sort of developmental stages. They don't look like adults when they're born. For reproduction and development, there are some specialized features. For sexual reproduction, the gametes of species combine in a process known as fertilization. When small movable sperm travels towards larger eggs that are usually not moving themselves. They may be brushed down fallopian tubes by beating cilia, but they themselves do not move. Fertilization and the fusion of gametes produces a, a diploid nuclei in an organism called a zygote. This process may be internal, especially if you live on land, or it might be external, especially for those organisms who reproduce in water. Developmental sequences continue after the formation of the zygote, cells divide and become special. That's what differentiate means. They change from one another to make the different specialized types of tissues. In asexual reproduction, especially those more simple body planned animals, those without backbones, um, they, under, they can undergo asexual reproduction. It tends to be something like budding or fragmentation where a piece breaks off and grows into a new individual or it may be something like parthenogenesis, where an unfertilized egg can actually develop into a new offspring, essentially because of an error in division. We split up animals on kind of this generalized platform. So we have animals that have true tissues and those who do not. The animals with true tissues are either radially symmetrical and diploblastic, so they have two tissue layers and they're organized around a center point or they are bilateral, the same left and right, and they have three tissue layers. From the bilater bilateralia, excuse me, we look at individuals who are protostomes, who, who develop their mouth first, or those who are deuterosomes, those who develop their anus first, and then we split it from there. So I mentioned symmetry, and there are three different kinds of symmetry that we can consider. You can be asymmetrical, so you can have no symmetry to speak of. You can be radially symmetrical, so you're, you are symmetrical, but it's around a center point. Or you can be bilaterally symmetrical, so you're the same left and right. I mentioned tissue layers. You can be a diploblast, so you have two live tissue layers and some non-living material in the middle of those two layers. Or you can be a triploblast. You can have three living tissue layers that can make organs and specialize and serve a really helpful function. When we look at the triploblasts, they can be acelomates, eucelomates, or pseudocelomates. Uh, eucelomates or true coelomates have a body cavity within that middle layer called a coelome that does something. It's lined with mesodermal tissue, so it has its own tissue source and it can develop with advanced kind of um, advanced jobs to do. Pseudocelomates have a similar body cavity, but it's just lined with mesodermal tissue. It's lined with some tissue that exists on the inside of the animal called endodermal tissue, but it doesn't have as many um, as many specialized functions as those eucelomates or the true coelomate organisms. The acelomates don't have that special cavity at all. 
They tend to be solid throughout and there's no specialization in the mesoderm. I mentioned the difference in protostomes and deuterostomes. So at one point in time in your development, you were simply a hollow ball of cells that had one opening before anything else developed. If that single opening became a mouth first, those organisms are called protostomes. If that single opening became an anus first, those individuals are called deuterostomes. The reason we break them up on that classification is because all of the protostomes follow the same developmental pattern and all of the deuterostomes have the same genes that are dictating their same developmental pattern. <clears throat> we will begin our discussion of the animals with phylum Porifera. These are the sponges. They have a cylindrical based body with a large central cavity known as a sponge seal. Water enters through the outside of their bodies through numerous pores and it all flows out the top which has a large opening called an osculum. The outer layer of the sponge has flattened cells and an inner layer of cells called choanocytes. Sometimes you hear it pronounced uh, choanocytes. And those two layers are separated by a jelly-like mesophyll in the middle. The mesophyll is embedded with spicules, which are little tiny proteins that help to give this sponge kind of a little bit of structure and a little bit of rigidity. Those choanocytes are embedded with some of those spicules as well, or embedded in with those spicules as well, excuse me, and they have flagella that protrude into the inner surface of the sponge. Food particles come through the pores in the sponge and they're trapped by a mucus that is produced by those choanocytes, and then they're enveloped uh, in, in parts of the plasma membrane that's invaginated and it pulls it in through the process of phagocytosis. So what we learned about with our lysosomes. So sponges undergo intracellular digestion and then there are little cells called amoebocytes that help to deliver all of those nutrients to the other cells in the sponge's body. So even if your particular cell didn't digest food, there are other cells that can deliver it to you. Sponges usually undergo asexual reproduction, but it can actually be sexual. They can release egg and sperm called gemmules into the water around them. They meet and form a zygote, which will find a new substrate to attach to and then grow and live out this long sessile body plan. The next phylum to discuss is phylum Cnidaria. Cnidarians are well known because they have stinging cells called cnidocytes. Cnidocytes contain really large organelles that's called a nematocyst and it's got a little coiled thread with a really sharp barb in it. And when you brush the hair-like projections on the top of these little nematocysts, or excuse me, the cnidocytes, little nematocyst like springs out and it stabs you. So if you've ever been struck by a jellyfish, that's what was happening to you. These are cnidarians. All cnidarians have two tissue layers. They have an outside epidermis and an inside gastrodermis, and then the, the middle layer is the mesoglea. Within that body lining, there are a few different types of cells. They have nerve cells, cells that will secrete enzymes for digestion, specialized cells for nutrient absorption, and then there are some intracellular connections that kind of allow the body to talk to themselves. Cnidarians, most commonly known as jellyfish, undergo extracellular digestion. So they have uh, a gastrovascular cavity with one opening. You pull food into that cavity. Those enzyme secreting cells release digestive enzymes, which break down the food. You absorb the nutrients and then you expel the waste out the same opening. We split the Cnidarian phylum into four classes. Class, class Anthozoa is one of the ones that's most recognizable. They have a sessile polyp body form. This is your sea anemone, sea pens and corals. So if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, he lived in an anemone. He lived in um, a member of Class Anthozoa. There are about 60, uh, 6,100 described species. They tend to be very brightly colored, cylindrical in shape, and attached to substrate on one end. They have a singular opening to their gastrovascular, gastrovascular cavity and little tentacles that can pull food into their mouths. And they can also use those tentacles to sting their neighbors and kind of lay stake to the area around them. 
The next class of these anthozoa are the schizozoans. These are all jellies. They're motile, exclusively marine. They're about 200 described species. They tend to spend most of their lifetime in the medusa form of the body plan, but they do have a polyp stage. They can be anywhere from two centimeters to two meters across. There's a lot of variability in jellyfish. And they all, of course, have that very characteristic bell-like body shape as seen here. Class Cubozoa is also in this phylum Cnidaria. These are similar to jellyfish, but they are square in cross-section. They are anywhere from 10 to 25 centimeters, anatomically similar to those jellyfish, but they vary in the arrangement of their, their tentacles. Rather than having tentacles all around that bell, they have muscular pads called pedula um, at the corners of their bell-shaped cavity, and then there are a varying number of tentacles attached to those little muscular pads. The digestive system of Cubozoa may extend into those pads, so they're really great. They can be kind of ravenous eaters. They typically exist as um, in polyp form when they're really young, but then they develop into the medusa form as they grow. The polyps may bud to actually form more polyps if necessary prior to transforming into these medusoid forms, and that's usually dependent on the environment. If they're stressed, they might make some more polyps first and then kind of become this bigger form. The last class of cnidarians is class hydrozoa. There's about 3,500 species of hydrozoans. Most of them are marine. They have uh, some, some of their lifespan is spent as a polyp, like you can see right here. Some of their lifespan is, sent, is spent as a medusa. It's really dependent on what species you're looking at. They live in colonies, which is pretty neat. They're whole branches of specialized polyps that share a single gastrovascular cavity. So they really live in like an interconnected, interdependent colony, which we don't always see in some of these kind of lower order simple, simple animals. They can be free floating um, as a colony or they might all be stuck to the same substrate. And some of the characteristics that are shared by all 3000 of these species are that their gonads come from epidermal tissue, which I realize sounds really specific, but in every other Cnidarian, you actually get the gonads from the gastrodermal tissue. So it's a really specific kind of higher level classification, but just know, sometimes students are like, these all look the same. I don't understand why they're categorized differently. Well, it's a big deal where your sex cells are coming from. And it's one of the things that we have chosen as scientists to use to classify the different types of um, classes in phylum Cnidaria. The third section in this chapter is about flatworms, nematodes, and arthropods. In these instances, all of them are triple blastic, so they have those three layers of cells or three layers of tissues, we should say. They have an embryonic mesoderm that's sandwiched between the ectoderm, outside derm, and endoderm, which means inside derm. They're biologically, uh, excuse me, bilaterally symmetrical, and they have cephalization. So there's a concentration of nervous tissue and then their sensory organs at one end of the animal, and we call that the head end. When we talk about flatworms, they're acelomates and both free living and parasitic. Nematodes, also known as roundworms, are pseudocelomates that are also free and parasitic. And then we have the arthropods, and they are coelomates or eucelomates, true coelomates, with hard exoskeletons and jointed appendages. Nematodes and arthropods belong to a similar clade, which is called the uh, ecto excuse me, ectozoans. These all have a hard cuticle covering their body that must be period good heavens periodically shed and then replaced in order for them to increase in size. Here's an example of a flatworm. It is a member of phylum platyhelminthes. It's free living. It's got an incomplete digestive system, excretory system that has a little network of tubules throughout its entire body. And its nervous system is made up of two long nerve cords running around either side with little connections between either end. On one end, you'll notice they also have eye spots, which can help them um, find light and sense shadows, which can help them to find food. 
When we look at flatworms, the Sphylum platyhelminthes, we can divide it into four classes. There's the Bedford platform, which are members of Tubularia. There's Trematoda and Cestoda, and then Monogena, that's not shown here. Flatworms are all pretty basic in their biology. They're exactly as they sound. Very, very, very flat worms. <laughs> the nematodes are roundworms. They're pseudocelomates. They're free living and have parasitic forms. These have a complete digestive system, which makes them different from the flatworms. And they also have a stronger cuticle on the outside of their body, which means they can withstand kind of tougher external environments because they have a little bit more chemical and physical protection from what's around them. Arthropods are 85% of all known animal species. The name literally means joint foot. Um, so they all have jointed appendages. So they've got these you know, and elbows is what we mean by joints. They have exoskeletons made of chitin and they're true coelomates. They all have heads, thoraxes, and abdominal regions. Some of them may be fused together. And when it comes to their respiratory systems, it's quite variable. Some of them have gills and some of them have trachea systems with spiracles. So the spiracle is an opening on the outside of the body in the exoskeleton. And then the trachea are little pores that lead to different parts of their body. So they don't actually have like a gas exchange, like a pumping process. Um, and said it's kind of functioning by diffusion and water is continuously moving into and out of the body through all of these openings. Arthropods like the one in this fossil are called trilobites and they used to rule the world. <laughs> trilobites were absolutely everywhere. They existed in a time known as the Cambrian. They underwent the process called the Cambrian explosion, where there was this incredible increase in diversity. And while we don't have trilobites on our planet now, we do have an awful lot of animals that look similar to the trilobites, and they all tend to share some of the same basic characteristics. So when we talk about arthropods, they either have book lungs, gills, or that trachea system. In this case, you can see kind of the typical body plan of um, a, we have a horseshoe crab over here on the right-hand side and an arachnid over on the left-hand side, but they have lots of different ways in which they can exchange gases. The most common arthropods that we are probably familiar with are the hexapods. Hexapods are your typical bugs. So in this picture, you can see a bee, typical bug. It has a head region, then a thorax, and an abdomen. You can kind of note the nerve cord, which runs the whole length of the body. It's got a dense cerebral ganglion. So it is a thinking animal, though it probably doesn't, doesn't feel anything. Um, note the easy segmentation and the six pairs of, le or the six legs and three pairs. That's where the name comes from, hex is six. Hexapod is six legs. So these are our typical, typical insects with their nice developed digestive system. Miripoda is another group of arthropods that we often study. These are our centipedes and millipedes. They can range anywhere from 10 legs to 170 legs. We tell the difference by how many legs per segment they have and what their mouth parts look like specifically. Crustaceans are really well known of arthropods. A crayfish is an excellent example of a crustacean as is a lobster or a crab. Crustaceans stand out in arthropods because they have a different carapace. The hard covering in their body also includes a little bit of a calcium, um, a calcium substance and that gives them a tougher body. So crabs crunch just like bugs do, but it's a lot harder to crunch a crab and that's because they have that specialized exoskeleton. We can also look at the Coelocerata. So these include our scorpions, spiders, animals of that nature. They get their names from their specialized mouth parts. Some of the mouth parts can inject venom. Other mouth parts are simply um, kind of little tiny food shovels. <laughs> animals that fall under this class can use these specialized mouth parts to help shove food into their mouths. It makes them more effective eaters. 15.4 is all about mollusks and annelids. When we talk about mollusks, it's a very diverse group of animals, usually marine, and we're looking at anything from really large predatory squids to octopi to um, tiny little garden snails. 
for the annelids, we are considering organisms like earthworms and leeches and polychaetes. A lot of them are marine, some obviously are not. We know earthworms live in the soil, but we study them together because they are both part of clade Lophotrochozoa, which is a nice mouthful. Um, and these also include other worms. And the reason that we make them distinct from the ectodozoas that we've already studied with the nematodes and the arthropods is due to DNA analysis and differences in how they grow. So here we have so here we have sorry a classic mollusk. You can notice that it's got uh, a lot of body parts. We break it up into two major segments. The round part of the body part is called the visceral mass, and that's where mollusks keep the majority of their organs. In this case, you can see that they're pretty advanced. They have a complete digestive system, gill structures, protected gonads, um, and a lot to them. Some of them have mantles, or they all have mantles surrounding that visceral mass. Some of them secrete a hard shell from that mantle, I apologize. The other important thing to notice about these animals is the chunk that isn't inside of that shell is called the muscular foot of the animal. And it's almost always used to help them move throughout their environment. The foot also often contains the mouth, commonly specialized with a radula, which are little rasping teeth that remind me of an escalator, the way in which they move kind of looks like an escalator. And they often um, also have the stalks that you see in this kind of generalized picture with eyes on the end of the stalks to help them see. Some of them have specialized plates on the outsides of their body. Um, class polyplacophora, they all have eight plates. You'll study some that are monoplacophora. They have one single plate protecting the outside of their bodies. It's uh, made from that mantle. And then some of them have no plates on them at all. There are a lot of gastropods that their shells are very important. That plate-like structure is very, very important to their bodies. They lose those shells and grow new ones over time, or some of them find older shells that have been lost and inhabit those instead. But even still, there are some gastropods that don't have shells at all. You can see kind of a typical forest slug on the right-hand side. It's the same body plan. You can tell by comparing the two pictures. It's the same general idea. One of them is just has a coiled body form that's up in that shell, and one of them doesn't. I found that what a lot of students really enjoy studying when we look at our gastropods are things like nautilus, cuttlefish, squids and octopi, they're all members of class cephalopoda, and that's because these can be so incredibly intelligent. Octopi are well known for letting themselves out of cages. They can open locks, twist the tops up of jars. Some of them have escaped from zoos. They're really, really, really smart predators. They have the same general body plan as all of the gastropods. They just have um, Larger brains and usually larger or longer tentacles, I should say. A lot of them also have the ability to camouflage themselves by changing the color of their skin. A final group to talk about would be, um, <laughs> so these are called tusk shells. And I mentioned this when I recorded the podcast for this chapter as well. These are really, really, really basic versions of gastropods. And I almost feel like they kind of got cheated being put after cephalopoda. So these little tusk shells have um, the mouth end is the skinnier end. They have the, they have the larger end. These tend to bury themselves in warmer waters, in the sand in warmer waters, and just put out little tiny tentacles and filter feed. So here's a really similar or really simplistic version of this mollusk. The next phylum that we'll discuss are the annelids. These are segmented worms that are found in marine, terrestrial, and freshwater habitats. The presence of water or humidity is critical for their survival. Their name literally means small ring. So they just have little tiny repeating segments. This idea is called metamerism, and each of those individual segments is a metamere. That's where metamerism comes from. Every, almost every segment contains every organ that the animal needs in order to survive. And this is really important because it allows for the evolution of independent modifications because every segment can kind of develop 
on its own. They're capable of performing their own functions. That means that one segment can change for an evolutionary advantage and it won't affect the overall health of the organism. When we study cross sections, we see that they all have bits of intestines, ventral and dorsal blood vessels, and the nerve cord. They also have these little CT, which allow the worms to pull themselves through the substrate. The CT can kind of be used like little tiny anchors. So you can stick your CT in the ground and then pull the rest of your body up to where you're anchored and then extend, stick your CT in the ground, pull the rest of your body up. And it allows these worms without any appendages to move pretty effectively through their um, chosen environment. CT are very helpful when you live in soil. The other thing to notice in this picture is they show you those little nephridium. Those are excretory organs that are found in each segment as well. We have kind of the classic annelids of earthworm on the right and leeches, or excuse me, earthworm on the left and leeches on the right. They're both annelids. Leeches are of course special because they can swell to such incredible volumes when they're um, absorbing blood, which is their food source. Section 15.4 covers echinoderms and chordates. These are both deuterostomes. So the, um, the anus forms first when they're a little blastopores. Sorry, I lost the word there for a second. For echinoderms, they're named for their spiny skin. They have about 7,000 living species. This is your sea stars, cucumbers, urchins, sand dollars, brittle stars. They're all exclusively marine. As adults, they have that pentaradial symmetry, but when they're larva, they are bilaterally symmetrical. If you're thinking back to the organization, be like, no, wait, these don't fit. They do, we consider um, their larval stage. The neat thing about them is that they have a water vascular system. They use water that comes in through madrepore and out tube feet to wash themselves, to share nutrients, gases, and uh, get rid of waste. A cool thing about echinoderms as well is that they have the ability to regenerate their body mass, even if over 75% of it is lost, which is pretty crazy. So here's the physical structure of echinoderms. We said they have that water vascular canal, which is unique for a lot of reasons. Um, the water comes in through the madrepore. You can see it in the, the kind of the top middle of the picture and it goes out those tube feet and it allows them to use hydrostatic pressure for movement. So it's not super fast, but it is incredibly powerful. There are a lot of different members of echinodermata, but they all look relatively similar to one another with the exceptions of the sea cucumbers, which kind of just look like bags that float on the ocean floor. But even still, you can see the little spines off of the sea cucumber, which um, allow it to fit in the echinodermata. Now about those chordates, I realize there's a ton of text on this slide, but chordates have four very important features and uh, everybody has them. You might not have them over the course of your whole life, but you have them at one point. Feature number one is a notochord. It is flexible and it is rod-like in structure. It's in your embryonic stage or your adult stage and it's located between your digestive tube and your nerve cord and it tends, it provides support. That is its purpose. In vertebrae, you have it as an embryonic stage. You don't necessarily have it when you are older because it's been replaced by your vertebral column. In non-vertebrates, they can have it in invertebrates, I should say, I apologize. They can have them throughout their entire lives. Future number two is the dorsal hollow nerve cord. So some animals possess solid nerve cords. Some of them are dorsal and hollow. But they all have it and it develops into the brain and spinal cord eventually, so they make up your central nervous system. All chordates have pharyngeal slits. These slits might stay as gills. The slits might become gill supports, or in vertebrates, the slits might become ears and tonsils, but they are all there in an embryonic stage. And finally, we have the postanal tail. It's exactly as it sounds. So it's post anal tail. In fish, it might become the back fin. In humans, it is lost in development. And in dogs, it might be tiny and leg bruising, or excuse me, huge and leg bruising, or tiny and adorable, but it's there. When we look at chordates, we have some kind of characteristic animals. What you're seeing right here is a lancelet, and 
it's uh, it gets its name from the knife knife kind of shape that it has. Normally, the whole part of this animal, with the exception of those tentacles on the lower right hand side, is actually buried in the sand, and those tentacles will filter feed. And that's where this guy is going to spend his whole life. But you can see all four of those features in a very simplistic animal. All four of the features are also maintained in the tunicates, which is class Urochordata. So tunicates have the features as, um, as larvae, which is what you see in picture B. They got all four forms, all four characteristics as larvae. But when they become adult, which is what you see in C, they lose some of those characteristics. But because they have them as larvae, they are classified as members of Chordata. So they kind of look externally like a sponge, like Phylum porifera, but when you consider the inside of the animal, it's far more advanced. So here are those lancets again, and you can see it now buried down in the sand and just little tentacles on the head end are sticking up. So the lancelets retain all four of those key features they had in its entire life. The last section is all about vertebrates. Vertebrates are the most recognizable animals because it's what we see, it's what we're used to seeing. There's about 60, 60 plus thousand species that have been identified. We tend to hear most about those that are getting ready to go extinct, unfortunately. We studied them, we study them as fish, amphibians, reptiles, and birds, and mammals. When we look at the fish, we start with hagfish because hagfish have a skull structure, but they don't have jaws. A lot of them are scavengers. They can feed off of live or dead organisms. It's what you see in picture A. And B, that is a lamprey. So that is a, it's similar to the hagfish, but it has a little bit more structure to it. And it also has a, like a rasping jaw. It's got these little tiny teeth that can attach to the side of an animal and feed. And they leave these big red marks where they were feeding, but they have, uh, kind of a slightly more developed body plan than the hagfish, but they're often lumped together when we study them. When we study fish, we also look at boneless fish. Sharks are boneless fish, they're chondrichthens. So they have bones in their head and they have bones in their jaws, but the rest of their body, their bony structures are made of cartilage, not what we think of as bones, I should be saying. I apologize. This, the hard calcium carbonate materials are not found in, in fish. Their, their bodies are made of cartilage instead. Stingrays are actually lumped with the chondrichthons when we study them, because if you look at their body plan, they're actually not that different. They're flattened, yes, but that's because those pectoral fins, the fins on the side of the animal, have gotten larger and attached to their head. But they too have jaws, but their bones are made of cartilage rather than the traditional calcium structure that comes to mind when you hear the word bone. Here we have ray finned fish and lobe finned fish. So these are bony fish, but their differences come in their fins. The ray finned fish on the left hand side has really tiny, skinny little rays of bone like material in its fins with thin membranes on either side. And those thin membranes uh, on their fins move together and they, um, it's just a, a really great identifying characteristic. If the fins don't, I mean, they help the fish swim, but they don't serve like any other crazy purpose other than swimming. And that just so happens to be their structure. The other fins, the other fish are lobed fin fishes. Lobed fin fishes actually have bone and flesh and muscles in their fins and their fins can move separate from one another. And that allows them to swim. Uh, they can pivot in exact circles. They are kind of a little bit more agile in their swimming. We thought for a really long time that they were actually extinct. And then someone found a coelacanth back in the 30s um, outside of Madagascar. They caught one while fishing outside of Madagascar. So these are really interesting fish. They are sometimes called push-up fish or relatives to push-up fish. Because they have bones and muscular tissues in their fins, it's kind of, it's easy to understand why we think that they are most closely related to amphibian because they have the bony structures in their limbs to allow them to have walked on land, which brings us to amphibians. Amphibians are animals that live in water for part of their life cycles. 
and in land for part of their life cycles. We can break them up into those who have tails, those are the salamanders, those who don't have tails, those be frogs, and those who don't have limbs, which are these tiny little crazy creatures. Uh, salamanders are interesting as well. Um, so not only do they live in water and on land, but they also breathe through their skin. So their skin must be kept continuously moist. And we find that in a lot of frogs also, but there are some frogs that are capable of breathing just fine without constant moisture on their skin. So if salamanders are capable of breathing through their skin, do they also have lungs? The answer is yes. They're not great. They're pretty small. If you ever dissect a frog, you'll see too in them that their lungs kind of a lot of times look uh, a little bit like raisins, like lumpy raisins, because they're not super effective, but they don't need to be. They breathe through their skin. They're also ectothermic, which means that they derive their heat from the environment in which they live. Another thing that stands out with the frogs, with the tailless amphibians, is the fact that they undergo the process of metamorphosis. So there's a very clear, distinct difference in a um, young frog to a juvenile frog to an adult frog. And you can see that progression here. In this picture, you can see a Sicilian. So this is also an amphibian, but it lacks external limbs and it lives under the soil. Usually here you can see that it's swimming. So they live in water, they live in really wet, damp soil. They're also lacking in eyesight. They have eyes, but they're almost entirely blind, which is fine because most of them live under the water. So what do they need to see for anyway? Or they live under soil, excuse me. There's no light. They're not particularly interested in seeing. But these are actually amphibians, which is pretty interesting because they look, students see them and they either look like a giant earthworm or they look like a snake. Um, but they are, they have all the characteristics of being an amphibian. Moving right along, we'll continue with the reptiles, which are also tetrapods. So they have two sets of limbs with the exception of the snakes. They have lost their limbs, obviously, but they actually maintain the bone structure and the ability to create limbs. You have some genetic, um, genetic mutations in snakes can make snakes that have these little funky limbs, but they are special because they lay their eggs on land. They have hard shells. In fact, they are amniotes. So they have hard shells and then amniotic sacs around their embryos, which allow them to, um, exchange gases and waste and then protect their cells, shells, protect the embryos themselves, I should say, I guess, from water loss. And this allows them to be laid when there isn't a lot of water around or to not actually lay them in water at all. The other important feature they have is scaly skin. They do not lose water or oxygen through their skin itself. Unlike the amphibians, we mentioned they need to maintain moist skin for breathing. You don't have that in reptiles and this allows them to live outside of water for extended periods of time or even in deserts in certain situations. Um, the interesting thing that not all students realize is that birds are essentially modified reptiles. Instead of having scaly skin, their skin cells make feathers. Now, different feathers have different functions, but I mean, they're essentially the same thing. They are um, egg layers, they're tetrapods. And when you look at the specifics of what makes a reptile or reptile, birds actually have all of those, just not the scaly skin on the most of their bodies. They have feathers instead. Of course, they need other things in order to fly, which is the most famous thing when it comes to birds. They have hollow pneumatic bones. Female birds actually usually only have one ovary, which makes them a whole lot lighter. And they have uh, kind of different ways to organize their organs that are much smaller in order to make their bodies more compact, which allows for easier flight. The last major group of organisms we're gonna talk to or talk to you talk about are the mammals. <laughs> mammals are uh, organisms that have all of the previously mentioned characteristics. They have hair and the ability to produce milk though, and that makes them quite different. Not all of them, however, give birth to live young, which is what a lot of people attribute to mammals. In fact, there is a group of mammals called monotremes and they are um, platypi and members of Edina, which live in 
Australia, and they give birth to really leathery like eggs and almost immediately thereafter those eggs hatch into live young but still they do give birth to eggs but they have hair and they produce milk and are therefore mammals another really common group of mammals that don't give live birth in the traditional sense are the marsupials marsupials most of which live in australia i think there's like 230 species that live in australia and 100 that live elsewhere they give birth into pouches to very, very, very fragile young. And within those pouches, their young will consistently, I mean, almost constantly, feed off of um, continually producing milk ducts and they'll grow up in those pouches and eventually leave the pouches to live normal lives. But they give birth into a pouch rather than out into the open, like, excuse me, like the placental mammals do. So humans, Horses, giraffes, cats, dogs, we're all placental mammals. We don't have that hard protective shell, but we're still amniotes. We have that amniotic sac surrounding our young for gas, um, gas nutrient and waste exchange. We tend to study higher order animals, um, the primates. We study primates quite a bit. They're broken down into kind of the smaller monkeys and the prosimians, like lemurs and tarsers, and then the anthropoids. Anthropoids include the, the great apes, lesser apes, howler monkeys, gibbons, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans. And then of course we can also choose to study the human beings. We break apes apart because of, or we break apes into their groups rather, based on their body structures. So are they better meant, do they have body structures that make them better living on land? or almost entirely in trees? Are their eyes towards the sides of their face, to the front of their face? We actually split them by the way in which their noses point um, flat on the faces or downwards. And some of them are actually different with their tails. If you think about it, some monkeys have those really great prehensile tails for swinging in trees, but the ones that live on ground, they don't have those tails. They don't really have a use for kind of that fifth hand <laughs> that the tail essentially is and they've lost it over time, just like human beings. We don't have tails either. So those are our primates and our very last group of vertebrates in this very, very, very long chapter. And as I look to the next slide, I realized I never actually wrote it. So normally in this slide, you have what's next. I'm going to very strongly suggest you read this book and take a lot of notes. There's a ton of information. I tried to make this video as, as um, kind of condensed as I could, but I'm sure it's gonna be long. I'm sure I'll get comments on the link, but it is what it is. Essentially, I would read these chapters, take notes, and then actually spend some time with video resources and examine some of these things in their natural habitats because seeing them do all the cool things that they do is what's gonna draw your attention to help you memorize this information best. So good luck with chapter 15.